So in this video, I'm going to cover what some of the steps are for determining an equation of motion. I'll highlight these ideas in this video are pretty well covered in the reading actually from the, the third project from Monsim. So I posted that reading on the website. But what I'd like to do is sort of walk through those steps and walk through those steps in this video on a simple example. And then in the next video, we'll do some more complicated examples. So at a high level, here's what the steps are. Uh, the first thing that you want to do is simply think about it which is to say, if you're dealing with some kind of system and you'd like to understand how that system is going to behave, it's important before you start doing any mathematics to actually just close your eyes and play the movie in your head and ask yourself the question, what's that system going to do? So let's actually do a sort of simple example of that. Let's imagine that we're throwing a ping pong ball, right? So you've got a person and that person has a ping pong ball in their hand and they're throwing it. What's going to happen to the ping pong ball? Well, if you ever thrown a ping pong ball, you actually know what's going to happen. It's going to fly forward, but rather than following a nice um, parabolic trajectory like you probably uh, you know would think of, or sort of one half at squared type of trajectory from AP Physics, if you sort of watch what it does, it actually often follows a trajectory that looks more like that, right? That it sort of goes up, but then it falls down, almost kind of straight. So that's sort of an example of thinking about what this is, how this system is going to behave. So and if you sort of take this further, it's going to have a lot of velocity initially, and it's really going to slow down during its motion, and then finally speed up some as it goes down towards the ground. Okay, so that's the first thing you need to do is think about it, and often it's helpful to draw keyframes. Second thing that we actually need to do if we're going to do modeling is try to identify what the system boundaries are, which is really to say, ask the question, what is it that we're going to model and what are we not going to model? So for example, do we actually want to deal with this time when the person has a ping pong ball in their hand, or are we simply going to assume that our system is a ping pong ball, it has some initial velocity and we're interested in how it travels through the air. So when do we start modeling? When do we stop modeling and what are we actually modeling? And I'm going to propose in this case, just for the sake of simplicity, that for our system boundary, we're going to say our system boundary. So if this is one doing the keyframes, our system boundary is simply actually the ping pong ball. And so we're interested in what the motion of this ping pong ball is after it's left the person's hand. We're not dealing with modeling the motion of someone throwing a ping pong ball. We're instead dealing with simply modeling the motion of the ping pong, ping pong ball that has been thrown. Okay. Um, once we've got that system boundary defined, the next thing that we actually need to do is decide how we're going to think about that system. Are we going to think about that system as a collection of particles? Are we going to think about it as a single particle? Are we going to think about it as a set of rigid bodies? So this, is, this sort of question is, how do we frame the system? And at this point, we've really only got a relatively limited number of ways to frame it. We could either think about this ping pong ball as a single particle, or we could think about it as an awful lot of interacting particles. And we could sort of break it down eventually to thinking about it as consisting of, you know, probably on the order of 10 to the 21 or 10 to the 22 atoms. We probably don't want to do that. We'd like to actually think about this as being a sort of single particle. So for this particular case, we're going to use a particle model. And so in doing that, we're abstracting away all kinds of information about how this ping pong ball might deform or what the sort of different ways are that it might rotate. We're really thinking about it as just a point mass that's moving through space. Okay. Fourth step that we need to think about is now that we've identified what the system is and how we're going to model the actual system, we need to think about interactions. Right? So if we think about this case of the ping pong ball, what are the ways that it interacts with the rest of the universe? Well, one obvious way is gravity. Right? Unless I'm throwing this ping pong ball in outer space a long ways away from everything else, there's going to be a gravitational interaction between the ping pong ball and the Earth. Uh, presumably this ping pong ball in traveling through the air experiences some kind of air drag. Right? So air drag is probably going to be important. And certainly if you've ever thrown this ping pong ball and given it some spin, it's also possible that you could have sort of spin that would give you um, magnus force. So those are sort of three examples of the kinds of interactions that you might deal with. And you need to choose which of those interactions you're actually going to focus on. So I'll say that for the purposes of this video, we're going to ignore Magnus force, and we're simply going to deal with drag and gravity. Okay. 
So we know how we're modeling the part of the system. We're saying it's a particle. And we also know what the interactions are between the system and the rest of the universe, which leads us to the fifth thing that we need to do, which is identify the free body diagram. And I'll note that all these steps so far are things that we've been doing all along. So our free body diagram for this um, ping pong ball is you have the ping pong ball. Obviously, there's gravity acting on the ping pong ball. And then there's also a drag force acting, and the drag force is going to counteract the motion. So if the ping pong ball is moving in this direction, the drag force will be opposite the velocity that the ping pong ball is moving at. Okay. All right. So we now have a free body diagram. And now we start to pull out some of the mathematical tools that we've been dealing with in this, in this module and in the last module. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to ask, ask the system, what, ask the question, what's the coordinate system? And what are the parameters that we're dealing with? Well, for modeling a ping pong ball, it seems like maybe a Cartesian coordinate system is a good choice. So I'll choose to have an x-axis and a y-axis. I'll say that my ping pong ball is located at some position, r vector, right, where I can write r vector as being x times i hat plus y times j hat. Um, and I'm going to say the ping pong ball also has some mass. And presumably it also has some cross-sectional area, right, which has to do with what the radius of the ping pong ball is. And since I'm going to be dealing with drag, it also probably has a drag coefficient that's associated with that, with the shape of that sphere. Okay? So these are characteristics or parameters that have to do with what the actual ping pong ball of the system is. Okay? So we've defined our coordinate system, we've defined our parameters. The next step that we need to undertake is to figure out what the mathematical models are for interactions. And so in this case, those mathematical models will be fairly simple. I should have said math models here. Um, we know, for example, that gravity, since we're close to the Earth's surface, we're going to say, oh, a constant gravitational acceleration is appropriate. So the gravitational force is minus mgj hat. And we also you know, have dealt with drag enough to know that we can write the drag force as being opposite the direction of the velocity. So I'll write a V hat out here and a negative sign to indicate that it's opposite the direction of the velocity. Since this is traveling through air, probably an inertial drag type of model is appropriate. So it's proportional to the magnitude of the velocity squared. And then there are these various coefficients out front, the drag coefficient, the density of air, and the cross-sectional area of the, of the ball. Okay, so now we have mathematical models for the interaction. And the final step that we need to deal with is we need to combine the fact that we have a free body diagram, the fact that we have a coordinate system defined, and the fact that we have a mathematical model for the interaction to actually figure out what the equations of motion are. So we're going to determine the equations of motion by applying conservation of momentum. In other words, by applying Newton's third law that says the time rate of change of the momentum is the sum of the forces that are acting on the system. Okay? And so in this particular case, if we wanted to go ahead and apply Newton's third law to this, so we'd say, OK, dp by dt, time rate of change of momentum, is the sum of the forces. If I blow up the left-hand side, that's d by dt of the mass of the ping pong ball times its position. And if I take that derivative, the mass of the ping pong ball is not changing. The position is changing in time. And so that will be mass, or sorry, this is d by dt, mass times the velocity of the ball. So this will be the mass times x double dot i hat plus y double dot j hat, right? Because the velocity of the ball here is simply x dot i hat plus y dot j hat. Okay. So my left-hand side is simply mass times acceleration. Not very surprising since the time rate of change of momentum is simply mass times acceleration when there's not a changing mass in the system. On the right-hand side, on the other hand, I've got to add the forces together. So when I add those forces together, I first can just write it sort of notationally as saying that's the force of gravity plus the force of drag. But as I 
expand each of those out into their into the coordinate system. Well, the force of gravity is minus mg times j hat, and the force of drag is minus one half rho c sub d a magnitude of velocity squared times v hat. And I can further expand this out in my coordinate system, right? The magnitude of velocity squared is x dot squared plus y dot squared, right? So that's what that is. Let's put our coefficients out front here. So we have one half rho cd drag coefficient times cross section area times the velocity squared. And then v hat, of course, is simply the velocity vector. So we want to construct a unit vector in the direction of v. So we take that vector that's the velocity, x, x dot i hat, y dot j hat, and we divide by the magnitude of the vector, so square root of x dot squared plus y dot squared. Okay. So here is our sort of full-blown vector equation of motion. Right. Mass times the acceleration in the x direction plus the mass times the acceleration in the j hat direction is equal to the gravitational force in the j hat direction and the drag force, which has both an i hat and a j hat component. Now I want to just note here that this is a vector differential equation, which is to say that since we're in two dimensions, it's actually equivalent. Sorry, I've run off the page here. Let me reorient this for you. Since it's a vector differential equation, it's actually equivalent to two scalar differential equations. And, and so we could actually now say, OK, if this is true, the only way this can be true is if all of the i hat stuff on the left hand side has to equal i hat stuff on the right hand side, and all the j hat on the left hand side has to equal j hat stuff on the right hand side, right? So that will make this true if we actually have both of those. And so we can now start to collect some terms and say, okay, well, we've got m times x double dot i hat, that's the left hand side i hat terms, has to be equal to minus one half rho c d a x dot squared plus y dot squared times x dot i hat over square root of x dot squared plus y dot squared. Okay. So there's one of my differential equations. And note that I could just cross out the i hats on both sides now. And similarly, my other differential equation will be m times y double dot is equal to minus mg minus one half rho cd times a. And here I'm going to be a little bit um, clever and observe that I've actually got um, this term squared here. And then I've also got the, I've got this term and then the square root of that term there. So I can simply take the square root of x dot squared plus y dot squared times y dot. So there I now have two differential equations. They should look fairly familiar because you did this for the, the Manuel Ramirez problem, but we simply have the acceleration in the x direction is simply the component of the drag force that's in the i hat direction, and the acceleration in the y hat direction, it depends both on what the gravitational acceleration is and on what the y component of the drag force is.